so my name is Rob Bischofsky with GL Communications. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be doing here today is providing a, um, a session on voice quality testing or polka testing specifically. Um, how uh, uh, to use polka, uh, how you can generate voice quality uh, analysis uh, between um, two endpoints. So let's get started. To go back to the beginning here, as we start, testing the quality of a call, whether the call is radio, analog, or wireless cellar, cellular, has been a time-honored tradition going back to World War II. Before any voice quality algorithm was available, the Harvard sentence, created by MIT in the 40s, was used as the uh, subjective test stimulus human beings rating the voice using a one to five scale. So here you can see humans listening to the, to the Harvard sentence and giving the uh, response of a one to a five. This is how it was done. Now back in uh, mid-1996, the ITU came out with ITU P800, Methods for Subjective Determination of Transmission Quality. This was the first spec for voice quality. Shortly after that, in 1997, both PSQM, created by uh, KPM, which is Perceptual Speech Quality Measure, and PAMS, created by BT, which is Perceptual Analysis Measurement System, um, those algorithms were released. PSQM was based on ITU P861, and PAMS was simply based on the ITU 800 spec. Both algorithms used psychoacoustic mathematical modeling algorithms in order to provide voice quality scores. The models use an intrusive method of sending voice through the network and recording voice at the far end, basically end-to-end -end testing. Now PAMS was introduced, um, well, when PAMS was introduced, it also introduced time alignment algorithms to align the voice utterances. Both algorithms worked somewhat well, provided slightly different results, but neither really worked well when used with the upcoming VoIP networks. So now we jump to 2001, and uh, PESC, Perceptual Evaluation of Speech Quality, was introduced under ITU P862. This was joint developed by KPN and BT, the developers of PSQM and PAMS. This algorithm had improved features from previous uh, algorithms, including level alignment, input filtering, auditory transform, time alignments, things like that. Now, PESC went um, through, a, through, a, uh, through a, a few adaptations, including PESC LQ, PESC LQO, used a lot for mobile networks, PESC Wideband, which was introduced as 862.2, um, however, PESC Wideband had limitations with several VoIP Wideband codecs as the results were uh, too low. This was an issue as VoIP was now taken off. This is a sample uh, PESC analysis being used with, our, uh, with the GLVKT software. Um, here you can see a female degraded file with five utterances. Um, with approximately five seconds of speech and a score of 3.7. This was a narrow band test. Now we jump to 2011. So that was our history. Now we're going to go into Polka. And this was when Polka was released under 863, ITU P863. The Polka algorithm is a joint development from Opticom, SwissQual, and TNO. Uh, Polka narrowband algorithm, so Polka has two sides to it, narrowband and super wideband. The narrowband portion uses similar methods as PESC. Um, however, uh, where Polka really advances is with the wideband and super wideband voice analysis. So it supports narrowband, wideband, super wideband. The Polka algorithm had a revised uh, psychoacoustic and cognitive model allowing true quality prediction for a variety of wideband void codecs, including EVRC. This is something that PESC really couldn't do well. 
It also provided temporal alignment, sample rate estimation, level alignment, and some better time alignment. Basically, it was set up so that it could be used on virtually any network. Well, here's a, um, the same type of picture um, where we showed the PESC um, VKT picture. Here's a Polka P uh, VKT picture. And this time you can see, instead of multiple utterances, we're actually sending two sentences through the, um, through the network. And I'll show you a little bit later how we're actually sending the voice through the network. Now, the voice is still around um, five to eight seconds, but it uses specific sentences in different languages to go through. This specific uh, sentence was uh, female, and it was wideband. Uh, going through a wideband network and producing the score. So now, with Polka testing, we, uh, we basically can test anything, uh, any type of network. So here you can see um, test testing at the top here of a hat system, a head and torso, uh, testing within a lab, testing IP phones, uh, the mobile network, um, uh, whether it's um, a circuit switched or voice over LTE, um, wide band or narrow band, doesn't matter. They can all be uh, tested. They could all be analyzed by Polka. Um, Two-wire analog, VoIP, uh, T1E1, everything can be used um, with the Polka algorithm. So Polka actually has two modes of operation as I sort of mentioned earlier, narrow band and super wide band. Um, narrow band is similar to PESC results. When running in super wide band mode, you can actually analyze both wide band, which is the uh, 7K, along with super wide band voice. Uh, the wide band voice is typically used in VoIP networks and voice over LTE wireless networks, which is AMR wide band. Um, wide band also uh, includes next generation analog with HD voice through ATAs and gateways. So again, you can see in this picture that um, we have um, the narrow band section of voice, uh, and so when we're testing in that that area, you're only sending from uh, uh, up to about 4,000 hertz. And then in the wide band, we're going up to a little bit more than 7,000 hertz. Okay, so if you're, if you're sending voice, um, wide band voice into a narrow band network, you're actually going to cut off a lot of the, uh, a lot of the voice um, or a lot of the frequency of the voice, which will cause degradation, as I'll show later. So in order to generate a Polka score, we use an intrusive method for sending and recording voice end-to-end -end through the network. This can be used to test a network or test a device. Um, so it's, it's used for a variety of different ways. The recorded voice or the graded file along with a copy of the file sent or the reference file are placed into the Polka algorithm and a result based on a one to five scale is produced. This is your Polka score. Now, methods for sending and recording the voice through the network is crucial. This is crucial because you have to obtain the most accurate results. In other words, the test equipment should not generate any loss. It should be able to specify levels, outbound and inbound. This is very important in, for instance, a, a mobile radio network. And it should be able to synchronize the sending and recording of voice between the endpoints. So you don't want to uh, miss any of the recorded voice. And you don't want to record something that's not supposed to be analyzed. So whatever is sent, uh, if it's a five-second file, that's what should be recorded. Now, there can be silence at the beginning and end of the file. That just, just gets dismissed. But the, um, uh, all of the sent voice needs to be recorded, and nothing but the sent voice should be recorded. Now, while the POCA algorithm does not degrade the, uh, the voice due to low or high signal gain. Other factors such as noise and amplitude clipping would absolutely have an effect on the overall score. So if your, your levels are too low but the noise floor 
is now impeding on that, you will get a uh, lower score. Now, GL provides several solutions for sending and recording voice, manually and automated, through your network while either connecting to uh, the endpoints or replicating or simulating the endpoints. The recorded voice is then used within the Polka algorithm. So here we can see that we have a uh, V-quad system on the left-hand side with a dual UTA, um, which is a GL piece of hardware that connects to the PC. Now the dual UTA is a, is a small box, connects to the PC via USB, and has a bunch of interfaces on it, along with the codecs and so forth, in order to uh, generate the voice and record the voice. This gets connected to a variety of, or whatever equipment is under test. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a V-Quad probe, which is basically the same thing as the V-Quad and the dual, dual UTA, but it's an all-in-one system with the PC already intact. So here we're sending voice into the cloud, uh, whatever network it's connected to, and we're recording voice at the other end. And then we're sending the recorded voice to the um, uh, to the VQT system, which could be either on one of the VQuad uh, systems or it could be at some central location. It doesn't matter. And then the VQT system takes that recorded voice along with the original reference voice, um, analyzes it, and produces the the score, the Polka score, along with some additional analysis like signal and level gains and so forth. And then these results get placed into a database um, where you can then access it through a web browser, what we call our web viewer. So this becomes either a manual or a fully automated process. Now GL supports a lot of connections, as mentioned. Um, Bluetooth, so we can connect to any phone and uh, we can then send the voice into that phone, and that phone then um, generates a call to a far-end device. So this way, we are not network dependent. We're network independent. So if the phone supports uh, circuit switch, or the phone supports Volte, or the phone supports next generation 5G, we're ready to go. We're connecting to the phone as a headset with very limited, uh, very minimal degradation. Um, we can also connect to a phone through the, through the wired headset. Uh, we can connect to any type of radio, uh, military radio, mass transit, emergency services, um, and we can uh, perform the push to talk, uh, as well as putting the voice into and recording the voice out of the radio. So this, this allows for full analysis of the radios over the radio network. Um, we also have four wire analog interfaces where we can connect to pretty much anything. And we're connected to a head and torso. We can connect to, uh, we could be a headset onto a PC, for instance, connected to Skype. Um, anything that requires an analog injection, we can go there. In fact, we've connected to a hospital bed even, where the hospital bed has a communication interface to the nurse's station. So we tested that connection. We've connected to spacesuits. Anything, again, that has a um, uh, basically a mic and speaker. We can be a SIP user agent, so we can basically uh, be our own SIP call, um, uh, using the SIP protocol, generate a call into the network, and then um, set up the RTP stream uh, with, a, with any codec. We basically support all codecs. We can also uh, replace the handset of the phone at the curly cord and inject voice in that manner into the phone and record voice. And then we can also be 
um, two wire analog so we can be the analog phone connected into the network into a POTS or a gateway or an ATA or what have you and place the call and answer the call and so forth and we also have support for T1E1 um, basically um, setting up a CAS or an ICN type call and then sending a recording voice Now, we did a couple of tests. Uh, we did a, more than a couple, but I'm going to show you two of the test results here now. So um, one of the tests we did was um, Polycom to Polycom through our own network. So it's a Polycom VoIP phone. Um, this is what we have in our office, um, and we have a G722 uh, network, wideband network with a you know HD voice so we did some tests between these phones um, uh, sending wideband voice and using polka super wideband mode for analysis now in order to to do wideband um, as I mentioned polka has narrowband and super wideband modes doesn't have a wideband mode but for wideband what you'll be doing is you'll be sending the wideband voice, basically a down sample of the super wideband file into the network, and then you'll be analyzing that recorded wideband voice against the original super wideband file. Um, and then you'll get a result based on that. So that's exactly what we did. We took the super wideband file, down sampled it to a wideband, and this is provided to our customers. And um, this was uh, British English sentences, both female and male. And we sent this through the network, and then recorded it and analyzed it. Now you could see on the um, on both left and right sides, we you could see a female uh, outbound and inbound, and a male outbound and inbound. Uh, a typical test would be a bidirectional test. So when the call is set up, I'm going to send voice to you, and you're going to send voice to me. Uh, so I'll send to you, you'll record, and then you'll send to me, and I'll record. And we like to do both female and male so we get the different frequency responses. So on the left-hand side, this was going through the, um, the wideband network. We're sending wideband files into the phone. And you can see that the scores are pretty good. And in fact, the female scores are a bit better than the male scores through our network. So this tells me that the, the uh, higher frequency of a female voice fared better. Now we did the same test, sending a wideband file into the phone and then recording the wideband, but now we did it uh, on the right-hand side. This was a narrowband network. Basically, we generate, generated an outbound Skype call and returned the call back to another phone. Um, dropping the um, the network down to narrowband, and in this case, you can see the scores drop considerably. And this isn't to say that the that Skype caused the degradation. Basically, what happened was um, when we did this test, uh, since we're putting a wideband file in, it went out to narrowband. It cut everything from the four to seven k range. 4 to 7K uh, um, uh, frequency range. And so we analyzed the recorded file, which lost all that upper frequency. Um, obviously, there's going to be degradation, and obviously, it's going to drop the score. So um, in this case, we can definitively tell that uh, whether our network was wideband or narrowband. Now, we did a similar test using two Samsung phones and going through a Volte network, voice over LTE. Now, if both phones are um, voice over LTE, then we are going to go through an AMR wideband network in the middle, and we can confirm that. Um, if either phone, um, most phones, you can drop the, the, the type of network. So you, so you can basically say, no, I do not want to do LTE voice or voice over LTE. Uh, so once we did that, once we changed that setting, we 
instead of going over the AMR wideband network, we went over the AMR network, the narrowband network. So again, we sent both female and male files. We sent um, bidirectional. And in both cases of the, uh, the Volte tests and the, um, and the Polycom VoIP tests, we used uh, a couple hundred um, files in order to produce our results. So you want to use many, many files in order to get a good average. And again, so on the left-hand side, you'll see the, um, the MR wideband network. And you can see in this case, the male files fared a bit better than the females, a little bit opposite than the polygon. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, similar results for um, going through the narrowband network. Now, I mentioned we sent several hundred files through the network in order to do this. And this is what's also recommended when you're doing your own testing. Um, it's never good to just do one file and um, get a result and say, okay, that's my score. Because there are anomalies, there's, there's packet drops, um, there's uh, times in the network that, uh, you know, uh, it's um, the network gets very... Um, uh, congested and you can drop your score so you want to do it over a period of time you want to do it actually over um, uh, peak periods and non-peak periods as well so you can see that okay during this part of the day the, the, the score is dropped you can see some consistent results and you basically want to throw away any anomalies where the score drops right down and you'll, you'll see that later on I'll show you some pictures of that um, these anomalies don't really mean that much because it could just be that there was some packet loss right then and there and you lost a bit of the, uh, the voice. So the, um, our GL uh, VQT software, which includes the Polka algorithm and can also include the PESC, PAMS, and PSQM, P PSQM algorithms as well, um, these support a lot of different uh, um, features. Well, first of all, it supports all the different standards, as I mentioned. Um, and you can run tests with, with all the different algorithms or just specify a specific algorithm. Um, now, it's not really recommended to run Polka and PESC on the same files. They actually have different types of files to use, but you can do it. It's The software allows you. Um, now, you can, when you're using the software, you can run in a manual mode or in a um, uh, auto measurement mode, so automated mode. And I'll show you a little bit more about the auto measurement a little bit later, but it basically lets you set it up and then let it run without any user interaction. Okay, so I got a question. Let me get to that real quick uh, from uh, Jerry Chin. Uh, basically, um, is this several iterations of the same files or multiple files from a database? We're basically using the same files. So we're using a female file, and we're sending that many times, and then we're using a male file. You want to you use the same files for consistency. So if you're using different types of files all the time, well, then it could be the file itself. It could be... The, um, the highs and the lows within that file itself. So you want to be very consistent with your test as you're generating hundreds of um, voice samples. Our VQT also has, uh, obviously, detailed results and, and statistics. So um, we can show you the, um, the, the, the Polka score. The, um, we also have the R factor, E model R factor score. We also have a bunch of... Um, um, uh, other analysis or analytical measurements like delay measurement. And with the delay measurement, we can also give you jitter. So jitter is um, the time offset of each of the utterances. We can give you all the jitter, jitter information of the degraded when compared to the reference. Uh, now, if the, if the two files were sent and recorded simultaneously, which you can actually do with our software, 
um, then we can uh, then we can give you a one-way delay measurement as well, a very accurate one-way delay measurement. It's basically just the time alignment of the first utterance of, of the file. We also provide um, noise and signal levels, okay, of the reference and the grade, and then obviously the noise and signal level gains. Um, clipping, and I saw that there was a question about clipping. Um, what is meant by that? Well, the um, so the clipping is basically muted voice, muted voice at the front. Uh, or a muted voice at the end. And we can show you that. This is only in PESC we can do that, but we can show you um, uh, if there's any muted voice before the, uh, the file gets, uh, or before the, the, the start of the file, or the, at the end of the file. Um, in PESC, we can also show you PESC delay per utterance. So in PESC, there, as I showed you earlier, there are, are multiple utterances, one second utterances of, of voice um, and um, and we could show you the PESC score of the overall file but we can also show you the PESC score of each individual utterance so you can actually see uh, if there was one or two utterances that basically brought the entire score down. Now remember when you're doing a PESC or a Polka analysis, you're not only looking at the voice, but you're looking at the silence and the noise in the silence. So that's very important too. So you never want to use a, a reference file that has pure silence in between the voice because you'll never get to that. Uh, so you want to use silence that has some noise floor so it, it makes more sense. And then in PESC, we also provide the impairment factor measurement. Um, our, our solution also allows for uh, rating the scores. So you can rate it as excellent, good, fair, and poor. And it's all user specified. You can, so you can say, OK, this range is good, and this range is fair, and so forth. And this scale will then be um, provided with the results. And then we finally we have remote access capabilities. So uh, we can access the VQT through a CLI, for instance, and um, start the auto measurement or stop the auto measurement or generate a VQT um, score and get the results back to the CLI. And we have customers using this in Tickle, for instance, for testing. So one of the questions here is, is there any option in GL tool to improve the degraded voice quality apart from analysis? We're, we're um, analyzing. Uh, we're testing and analyzing. So we're not really improving the score. Now, we can give you um, insight as to why the score is low and, and um, where this is occurring. We're not improving the score. The only thing that we can do is... Um, when we're configuring the, the tool, we want to make sure that we're not uh, degrading the voice. So uh, we want to set up our tool in a way that, um, that is optimal. And then once we do that, we're going to provide you um, the, the analysis of what the, the voice that goes through the network or through your equipment. Hopefully I answered that question. Uh, again, this is the software. I just wanted to show this picture again and go through some of this briefly. Um, so on the front screen, you can see you're going to get a graphic of the result. Um, uh, this was actually a 3.97 score for Polka, and this was using four utterances going through the, the network. Uh, below you're going to see the measurement results down down at the bottom and uh, this is basically just showing you each result as it's as it's run whether it's run automatically or run manually the manual measurement screen you can put in two files a degraded and a reference hit go and you'll generate a score just as easy as that um, or again you can use the auto measurement or the remote CLI analysis is going to show you basically just all the analytical results such as jitter and clipping and signal and noise level gains and so forth. And these are also part of 
the results. Now, all the results can go to a log file, including all the analysis results, or they can be sent to a central database where you can then access it. I'll show you that a little bit later. The rating, again, that's setting it up for excellent, good, fair, and poor. You can see in the middle uh, left uh, that the rating was fair for this, which is not really true. A 3.97 is probably good, uh, but whatever way you set up the rating, that's what it's going to show. So it's probably anything below a 4 was fair in, the, in whoever set this up. Then you'll see all the scores. Uh, the, the, on the left, you'll see the, uh, the score from the last test, and on the right, you'll see the max, min, and average scores, which you can uh, reset at any time. So it's a, very, it's a simple software where um, you can run a test and you can see all your results. But for the most part, what you're going to do, when I say simple, I mean simple interface. Um, what you're going to mostly do is set it up for auto measurement, where it's going to be looking at a directory of files and analyze those files as they appear. Um, and you'll probably not even look at the software. You'll just look at the results in the database. So not going on to the auto measurement, I mentioned this a few times. So again, basically what happens here is when the, um, when the, um, the software <clears throat> uh, records the file, for instance, the vQuad records the file, and it becomes a degraded file, that file is transferred to wherever the vQt software is. Now the vQt software can be on the vQuad system itself, or it could be in some central location where if you have multiple vQuads, all of the files can be transferred to this one central location. So you don't need a vQt software on every single location. Um, so the, um, the vQt files are, um, or the degraded files are put into the vQt software, and the vQt software is configurable to look at these directories grab the file when it sees the file in the directory, analyze it, and then produce the result and send the result down to a central system, which we call our web viewer system. And then using the web viewer browser on a smartphone or a tablet or a PC or whatever, just to just access it through uh, IP, uh, you can then, um, or through internet, uh, uh, you can then access the results, query the results, filter the results, look at statistics, things like that. So it's all done automatically. The, the scoring of a VQT, Polka or PESC, and the, um, the actual transfer of the files to the VQT system all can be set up. So here's the auto measurement screen. <clears throat> and the auto measurement screen, you can see that um, you're setting up these, right here you have uh, six instances, and you're setting up each instance of a directory. So, for instance, you're saying, okay, if, I'm, if I see a file in degraded one, I'm going to grab that file, and I'm going to analyze it against um, a narrow band fem, female one file. Um, and I'm going to analyze it uh, um, as PESC only or Polka only or PESC and Polka and it could be Polka super wideband or PESC wideband so all these features are available you're specifying this per directory um, and then you can specify if you want to auto delete the file or you want to save the files to a different directory or a, an inventory directory or you want to just save the bad files and throw away the good files I don't want to relook at the good files, but I want to see what happened with the bad files. So all this is user specified, and then once you once you configure this whole thing, you can then save this auto measurement and have multiple auto measurement configurations. You can even set up the VQT so that whenever you start VQT, it loads the last configuration and starts it, starts running. So really, nothing to do.
And then again, for, for a remote access, we have the uh, CLI, which could be run from a, um, a command line window or from Tickle or from pretty much anywhere. Uh, in fact, we're actually implementing it now within our vQuad to generate a vQt score and send it back to the v, vQuad system. So with the CLI, there's a lot of commands you can do for, for instance, loading a, an auto measurement configuration, um, starting it, stopping it, all this stuff. But you can also just simply, as shown here, run a vQt measurement specifying the degraded and reference files, the uh, encoding, the type of algorithm, um, and, uh, and so forth, and then get a result. So I mentioned about um, with the Polka, um, algorithm and with 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 our with any of our tests with VQT that um, one method of seeing the results is sending all the results from VQT into our central database okay now of course you can see the results in VQT itself um, and VQT does create a log where you can then access that log file and it's I think it's uh, um, semicolon delimiter or comma delimited where you can then look at all the results all the analysis results and so forth um, so there are different ways to see the results but uh, we recommend the uh, the central database and the web viewer um, so here you can see um, polka results and um, with this screen you can you can see that we are we're time filtering for seven days um, and we can specify a, uh, a an actual filter where we where we are only going to look at a specific test or a specific device where where the the files were recorded. Um, and here you can see um, all these tests. Well, let's let's just go through this. So the vQuad timestamp. So that's the timestamp of when the test was um, was recorded or when the file was recorded. Not when the test was done, but when the file was recorded, because it could be that the the test was done a, a few seconds later, or maybe uh, days later, if you didn't transfer the files directly to the VKT software. So we're always maintaining the timestamp of when the file was recorded at, at, at that time. And then a call timestamp is actually when the call was set up. So you could have many results per call. In this case, we have four results per call. Um, and you can take a look and see if the, the score is deviating or, or is consistent within the call. And then the vQuad location is a, is a um, um, user-defined ID within the vQuad script that you can set up, and then you can filter on that. So it's just a lot of filtering mechanisms. The phone ID, again, it, that's coming from the vQuad, and it's, um, and it's a filterable uh, parameter. The lat long, um, if the vQuad has GPS receiver connected to it, which is possible, you can connect a GPS receiver, uh, we can then stamp all results with a GPS uh, lat long, and this is great for drive testing. So now you can see the results through a drive test and see um, uh, see how the test um, um, see if there's holes in the network or what have you. See where where the where which areas are better than other areas. Um, this is also good. You know, obviously this is most likely done with mobile or with with radios, but it's good to um, to test if you have two different networks. So phones from two different networks and you're driving around, you can then compare the two networks in the different areas. And then you can see the degraded file name, the rating, which is the user-defined rating, um, and then the scores. 
and all this can be um, output to uh, to a report, to an Excel uh, sheet, um, to a comma delimiter file, whatever is needed. Now we also provide statistics, um, and you can all actually have user-defined statistics. So I just got a question. Um, the definition definition of speech level gain and noise level gain. Okay. So um, basically what we're doing is we're looking at the speech level and the noise level of the reference and the degraded voice files. Um, and then we are showing you with the degraded file what the gain is. Either there's more uh, signal the the um, the amplitude was higher, so the levels were higher um, when you compare the degraded to the reference, or the levels were were, were a little lower. So if they were higher, uh, you could run into some um, some clipping, amplitude clipping, and so forth, or you can run into uh, some um, a noise on the network where your voice is too high, too loud. If the if the levels were lower, were were a lot lower, like if we saw a neg twenty dB, um, well, then we could be introducing the noise floor into uh, the um, um, into the uh, into loss uh, into, into having the the degradation, so that the noise floor would actually be closer to the signal, and that would cause degradation. And then again with the noise level. So the noise level gain is uh, the noise level uh, of the reference uh, or the noise level degraded compared to the noise level of the reference. You'll see how much noise was increased or decreased throughout the file. So hopefully that answered your question there. But those are very important. So this, these analysis results, um, you know, for instance, we're, we're showing you a score of 2.85. Now you want to know, okay, what does that mean? What does 2.85 mean? Now you can have a baseline of a score, so you can say, okay, if I'm going to run a, um, a test through a clean network, what's my score going to be? If I'm doing mobile, if I'm doing uh, VoIP, if I'm doing two-wire analog, what's my base score going to be? That's very important. Okay, that's the best I can do through this network. Now when you're running your tests and you get your score, it's going to be lower than that baseline. And you want to know well, why is it lower than that baseline. And the, you, you have to look at the signal level gain. You have to look at the noise level gain. You have to look at any type of jitter or clipping. Things like that are going to give you insight as to why um, the score was lower. And then going back to some of our test results, well, if the, if the score is much lower, uh, you're doing a wideband test, well, then you probably didn't go through wideband. You probably, uh, at some point through the network, it went down to narrowband. And once that happens, you lose that upper frequency uh, portion of the file. And you don't get it back. So your scores are going to degrade. So um, with the Polka statistics, you can actually look at, and this looks like a, a bunch of stuff here, and we have uh, a, a, uh, a bunch of lines with, with different call IDs. Okay, so this is a several different tests run. And um, each test may have X number of files, uh, a couple thousand files. And we're going to show you the, the min, max, and average scores of each test. And this is all based on what type of filtering you're, you're using in your, um, uh, in your web viewer. So if you're filtering on uh, the last 10 minutes, well, you're only going to have so many files then. But if you're filtering on the entire database, you're going to have a lot more files. So you want to filter on the, the, um, the start and stop of your test itself. And then you can filter on your uh, the, 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 the test ID or the call ID or the device name. 
So there's a lot of different ways to filter, and then once you do all that filtering, you'll only see what you want to see in the statistics. And you can see the averages and so forth, and and um, and any anomalies that may have occurred. And again, you can create your own statistics. So uh, this is something that's provided. The Polka statistics is provided as part of the, uh, as just a, a, you know, you click on it and there it is. But you can also set up to create your own type of statistics. For instance, looking at Polka and PESC at the same time, or Polka, PESC, and delay measurements at the same time in the same screen. And then this is actually... VQT results over time. So we're looking at Polka, and we could be looking at a lot of different tests. So this is not just a single test. This is a lot of tests. That's why you see a, a clump of scores as we go across. But this is great to see if, you know, any uh, inconsistencies. So, for instance, if we're, we are looking at, um, at a test going into peak time and off peak time, you may see a, a, a drop uh, of scores and then come back up um, as we go down to peak and back off you know, back to off peak. And you can see what type of um, um, of degradation you may have over time in a maybe even a static location. You'll also see anomalies, like um, uh, any type. Anytime you see a a dot, just you know, all the way down uh, uh, outside of the of the line, um, you can you can focus on these anomalies and 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 determine well, was this a a problem in the network? Usually, it's just a a simple drop of packets. Uh, that occurs every so often and shouldn't be a problem. Now, if you see if you see the anomalies occurring more consistently, then you have a problem. But every so often, it's not really a problem. But this gives you a good idea of how the results um, uh, fared over a period of time. And then uh, this is the actual uh, using Google Maps to plot the results when we're configuring our VQI with GPS. So here we um, we actually did a drive test. So we had um, our um, our VQI probe in a car uh, with um, with a phone with a with a mobile phone. And uh, I believe it was calling a phone back in our office. So there's another VQUAD in our office. So we were, we were running a test between the phone in the car and a phone in our office. And um, we were making a call. Uh, uh, after the call was set up, we uh, sent voice files um, from, the, uh, from the car phone to the, to the, to the static office phone and then back the other way. So bi-directional test, I believe we did um, four files per call. We hung up, waited a few seconds, placed the call again, redid the test. Which is the bottom left. This is where we started. This is our office in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And um, we drove in this direction through a, a new highway called uh, Maryland 200. Then we went up to Baltimore, then back west on Route 70, and then down 270. Okay, and uh, you can actually tell if you're speeding in during this test uh, because the uh, you can see you can actually see where the, um, the results show. You know. It, because uh, uh, um, the, the tests are running in a consistent time format. Um, but we tried to maintain speed throughout this entire test as best we could, I think uh, 55 miles per hour. Um, and you can see where they passed and they failed and so forth. Based on the score here, we, we mentioned that the uh, Polka score greater than 3 
greater than or equal to three, we're going to pass it. Less than three, we're going to fail it. Now, you can set this up any way you want. Uh, very easily, I can change this to say, okay, a 2.5 is a pass, and then replot it. No problems. You can output this to a, um, to a report if you want. And we're actually modifying this entire Google Maps screen to allow for more flexibility as we go forward. So that's basically um, my presentation of uh, Polka and uh, how the algorithm works and uh, how you can use it, how you can uh, generate the voice files and so forth. Hopefully it was somewhat informative, uh, but if you have any questions, you can certainly contact us, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions or provide you with, uh, with a demo of the solutions. Thank you.